Well, hello everyone. Thank you for having me. Again, I'm, I'm Elena. I'm a genetic counselor in Philadelphia. Um, and I'm going to be presenting on um, just some basic genetics and a little bit about DUPE 15. So I know I've met some of you already um, through the genetic consults. Me and Katie are another genetic counselor that will be meeting with some more of you um, later on today. All right, so just real quick, I have no conflicts of interest to um, disclose and information to just not be considered uh, medical advice. So an outline, I'm going to talk a little bit about just an overview of genetics and DNA, and then I'm going to dive into some of the differences that we can see in DUP15Q syndrome, including what causes it, um, which um, Jackie already um, talked about a little bit, and then some of the um, varieties of things that we can see in DUP15. Um, and I do want to say I was um, one of the people that had helped um, disclose the diagnosis for Fiona. So it's very great to see um, Jackie up here. So I, apparently I taught her well, because she knows um, quite a lot. <laughs> or I can't take credit for that, but I'll, I'll pretend to. Um, so just to start off overall, um, our bodies are made of cells. In our cells, we have DNA that provide the instructions for making our bodies. Um, DNA is really just a long string of letters. It gets packaged into these things called chromosomes that kind of look like those weird X shapes. Um, a gene is a section of DNA, a set of letters that codes for one particular protein. And a protein is that component that makes up all the different things in our body. Um, so a gene sort of functions like one recipe or one blueprint for a protein, whereas a chromosome is like a whole package of recipes. It is like a whole volume of recipes. And if we zoom in closer to these chromosomes in the nucleus of our cells, um, they could look something like this. So just a lot of things all spread out. Um, they don't always have these stripe patterns, but when we add different stain and dyes to them, that's how we get those um, stripes. And if we line them all up nicely, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So 46 total, um, again, as Jackie had mentioned, um, we have numbered 1 through 22. Um, and then we have our X and our Y. So we get one set from mom and one set from dad. Um, if you get two X's, one from both mom and dad, you're female. If you get an X from mom and a Y from dad, then you're a male. So again, just one of each from um, each parent. And if we zoom into a chromosome even more, and we have sort of this cartoon picture, um, we can sort of start to break it up by section and identify different parts of it. And again, these are sort of extra things that we sort of add and numbers and things to help us find um, a particular location in a chromosome. So trying to give it an address for some part of it that we're trying to talk about. Um, so in the middle, we have the centromere. That's where it sort of pinches together. On the ends, we have the telomeres. Um, and then the top part is the P arm. That's the shorter arm. Um, I've learned that like the P is um, short for petite in French, which means small. And then the Q is um, the longer arm. Um, I've heard that Q stands for tail in French. And I've also heard that Q just comes after the letter P. And so that's why it's there. Um, but regardless, Q is the long arm, P is the short arm. And then for each of these little bands, the different colored sections, we can give them numbers so that we can try to, you know, if we're talking from one person to another to compare what section we're talking about. Um, so I think to, an equivalent uh, or analogy for this is sort of like a mailing address. So we start with our chromosome 15, which is sort of like our country. Um, and I'll kind of walk through the, sort of the steps of this, because I think it's important when you're talking about 15Q11.2 to 13.1, just sort of understand like what this is talking about. So um, if we break this apart, then we have our P arm and our Q arm. I apologize, it doesn't quite line up with the chromosome, but you'll see why I couldn't quite do that. Um, this is sort of like saying the state after the country. Um, we can then break it up into sort of an initial series of these sort of bands or sections. So P just has one section, Q has two, one and two. Um, and when we initially were sort of doing these bands and these stainings, um, we weren't as good at getting fine grain detail. So we kind of can get more and more refined over time, but we sort of start with these big sections, which is what we could see way back in the day. Um, so this is sort of like, you know, the city. And we go to the zip code and we break it up more. So you can see P1 can be broken up into then 1, 2, and 3. And Q2 can be broken up in 1 through 6. 
And if we keep going now to a street address, we can continue breaking these things down um, even more. So, um, and like Q21 um, now has one, two, and three. And then finally, sometimes you can have even more refinement of this. This is sort of like an apartment number. Not everything has this final number, but some do to get really precise. And in this case, it's for Q2, uh, Q22.3, you can have one, two, and three. So when we combine this all together, looking back at our initial chromosome, that's how we get this long set of numbers that you often see when we talk about um, do 15. And the way we talk about them, we say the whole chromosome number, so that's 15. Again, they're numbered 1 through 22, so nothing fancy there. Then we say the um, arms, so that's Q. And then each of these other numbers we pronounce separately. So it's 15Q11.2 um, or 13.1, because again, they're each subsections of the one that came before. So it's not 13.1. So that's my pro tip if you want to sound fancy when talking with your genetic, uh, geneticist or genetic counselor. Um, if we pull up this section even more and look at it, as sort of Jackie had showed you, in it there are these different genes. And the genes, again, are sort of those recipes or blueprints for all the building blocks in our body. Um, so these are sort of uh, an important part of why um, extra copies um, cause Do15Q syndrome. Um, and we don't have one particular gene that causes Do15Q syndrome, um, but we know this, this region in here is the most important one. And we call this the critical region or the core region. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the PWACR, which is the Prader-Willi Angelman syndrome critical region. Um, and that just happens that uh, Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome are two separate disorders that also involve this same section. Um, so all of these are sort of referring to the same thing, this particular section on chromosome 15. And if we look at the genes in particular, again, there's no one that is the necessary cause, um, but these are some of the genes that are important in here. And I think you'll hear, be, being here, you will hear more about these um, in some future talks. All right, so getting now into DUP15Q syndrome, now that we've kind of had an introduction to this region. And this is caused by something called a copy number change. Copy number just refers to like the total copies of a region of DNA that a person has. And typically we have two copies of every region. Again, the one from mom and the one from dad. Um, DUP15Q is caused by having at least one extra copy of this particular region, that critical region, which is 15Q11 to 13. So this is just show, showing like a, a diagram of what this can look like. If we sort of pull out chromosome 15, you can see normally you would have the red, blue, and yellow section, just one copy. Um, a duplication is when you have an extra copy of that. So you can see all three of those sections, we have a second copy now. You can also have something like a triplication, where now you have three copies in a row of that particular region, um, or just three copies in, in total on one chromosome, so in another extra piece. And when we remember that we have that other chromosome from the other parent that we have in combination, that means typically we have two um, copies of something. Um, when there's a duplication, we have three total copies, and we have a triplication, there's four total copies. Um, so for DUP15Q syndrome, again, it involves having at least three copies um, of this critical region. Um, three to four is the most common, but there are people that have more than that. Deletions, where you only have one copy and you're missing the other one, um, that's what leads to the Prader-Willi syndrome or Angelman syndrome. So again, those are different disorders, but they involve the same region. They go the other way where there's less instead of more. So another um, variation that we can see is the location of the extra material. Um, these are sort of the big subgroups that we have. So we have the main ones are interstitial and isodicentric. So interstitial means it's in the same chromosome. So sort of like those pictures I just saw, you have one duplication and then there's another, or one, one um, copy of the region and then one more. Uh, most frequently, um, interstitial duplications involve three total copies, so one extra. Um, these can be uh, sometimes, but quite rarely, inherited. 
Isodicentrics involve having a whole extra chromosome. So both of the copies of chromosome 15 from the parents are typical, no changes there, but then there's a third extra chromosome that just has material from this particular region, the critical region. Um, typically, these involve four um, total copies, so two extra ones within that new chromosome. And these are uh, pretty much always de novo, meaning brand new in a child. So these ones are not ones we would expect to see inherited, certainly not inherited from someone that does not have symptoms. Um, there's lots of ways that people name this. I'm, for this talk, I'm going to just say isodicentric or IDIC, which is short for that. Um, but a lot of times on your lab reports, like the more technical name for it is something that's pseudodicentric. Um, sometimes they'll say it's a derivative chromosome 15 or a marker chromosome. For these purposes, they all basically mean the same thing. They're just sort of technical about how uh, precise it is and um, how specific it is. So this is now um, a diagram of um, an interstitial duplication. So you can see there's three total copies, one right after the other within the same chromosome. So if we make this picture called a karyotype where we look at all of your chromosomes laid out, there's two copies of chromosome 15 and otherwise a, a regular number of chromosomes, so 46 total. In isodicentric, there's 47 total because there's that one extra chromosome. So you can see there's two regular copies of chromosome 15, and then there's an extra isodicentric chromosome. Um, and you can see typically what they are is sort of the first section of chromosome 15. There's one copy, and then it flips over, and then there's another copy after. So you can see in this, there's, there's two copies of both the, the red, the blue, and the yellow within this extra chromosome. Um, there can be other varieties of this, um, so this isn't always um, exactly what someone has. The most common other type is that you can have an interstitial where there's only two uh, copies of chromosome 15, but there might be more than one extra copy in there. So maybe there's four total copies of this region, but there's only two of the chromosome. Um, there are cases where you can have um, an isodicentric chromosome that only has one copy of this critical region instead of two, um, or maybe there's more than two. Um, and then there's also been situations where people have more than one extra chromosome. So maybe you have two extra chromosomes, each with two extra copies, and so you can have a total of six copies of the region. So. Um, Dupe 15 and chromosome 15 can be endlessly complicated, so these are just some examples of things that you can see. But again, the most typical is we see interstitial with um, either three, sometimes four extra copies, or isodicentric with four total copies. Um, so the genetic test needed to determine the difference between um, an isodicentric and an interstitial is usually a karyotype, so making that picture of all the chromosomes so we can see are there any extra chromosomes. Um, this is often done with something called FISH that just helps us tag and figure out is this coming from chromosome 15 or somewhere else. Um, and a type of result of what this can look like, usually it'll say like a number, then XX or XY, and then something else. So in this case it says 47XX plus like derivative 15, meaning there's 47 total chromosomes. They have two Xs, so they're female. And then this extra chromosome, the 47th one, is made from parts of chromosome 15. So throughout this, I'll kind of give these little snippets of like what sort of test is used for this, what a result might look like. It's not meant to be comprehensive, but just to give you an idea when you're looking at your report of like, you know, something that might match something you've seen there. So another um, variety we can have is these different breakpoints, which is how long of a section is duplicated in the DUP15Q. So we go back to our little chromosome picture, um, and similar to sort of what um, Jackie was showing before, I just colored them a little bit different. We have these things called breakpoints, and this is where the body can um, slip and either start or end um, a deletion or a duplication. So again, we have this sort of critical region, which is between breakpoints two and three. Um, and you know, again, this is just highlighting those different breakpoints. Um, we can go straight from breakpoint two to three. This is and have a duplication. That's enough to cause DUP15Q syndrome, but it can also go from two to four, or two to five, 
and include extra genes, um, which could mean like a more severe presentation overall. Um, you can also start earlier and then go from breakpoint one to three, four, or five. So um, lots of kids can have different varieties of how big or how small the duplicated region is. As long as you have at least one extra copy of breakpoint two to three, that's Duke 15 q syndrome. Um, but again, all of these other changes can lead to someone being more or less severe. The test needed for this is usually a microarray, um, which kind of gives us a fine-grained detail of where um, a, a deletion or duplication starts and ends. And the result is usually a long string of numbers like this. Um, what it is telling us is this is starting at 15Q11.2 and going to Q13.1. It's now giving us the precise like numerical location of the start and end point. So that's saying if you take chromosome 15 and you go to the very top of it and the very first letter there is number one and you just keep going all the way down, this is starting at like number position like 20,141,782 and then going to 28,683,449. So lots of big numbers, but really just to give us really precise where it starts and where it stops. And then also tells us the number of copies. So in this case, times three means there's three total copies. So this is just a really fine-grained way of looking at it compared to something like a karyotype that just tells us something extra is there. Um, another thing to keep in mind is um, parent of origin. Um, and I'm going to just kind of go backwards to explain why this is important. Um, so this has something to do with um, a concept called imprinting, which is sort of how a, a gene might get turned off. So in this case, we're showing, I, I'm kind of showing two copies of um, genes, one set from mom, one set from dad. There's the purple gene and the yellow gene, and this is not imprinted. So all four of them are turned on. They are making their protein. They're all being what's called expressed. But when there's imprinting, certain copies can be turned off. There's nothing wrong with the gene itself. It just is turned off, and it's not operating. It's not making protein. So there are um, several genes in our bodies that are imprinted, um, and it happens that when we get like a copy from mom, it might be turned on, and from dad, it's turned off, and then vice versa the other way for another gene. Um, and that allows us to have one working copy of the gene instead of two, which helps to balance out for some of these genes. So this is kind of showing like within a sperm or within an egg cell, that's when certain genes will get turned on or off if there's imprinting. So that then when they combine together, you get the right pattern in the baby where there's one of each type. So several genes um, within um, this region are imprinted. So we can see here, it's a little bit small, but the, um, the pink ones are genes that are only turned on when they come from the egg. And the dark blue ones are ones that are only turned on when they come from a sperm. The light blue is ones that are um, more expressed or more protein is made from the copy from the sperm versus the one from the egg. And then green are ones that it doesn't matter, they're both turned on. So this might be a little bit out of date of exactly what we think um, each one comes from, but this just to give you an idea that in this region there are certain genes where if you had extra copies um, of a gene that was already turned off, um, it might not make as much of a difference. So having um, like extra copies of UBE3A, which is pink, um, if it was coming from the dad where it's already turned off, that might not make a difference because the, you'll have an extra turned off copy of the gene. Whereas when it's coming from mom, that would make a big difference because now you have twice as much of it being made because both copies are turned on. So again, just a thing to kind of keep in mind that they're treated a bit differently in the body, but not all of the genes are treated differently. Um, DU15Q, we typically think of it as being caused by extra copies of the maternally derived copy of chromosome 15. Um, and I say maternally derived because it's the one that comes from the egg. A lot of times it's not present in the mom at all. It was just present in one egg cell. Um, but there are other people with um, paternal copies that do have symptoms as well. Um, they can just be more mild or more variable. Um, there's a lot more research that needs to be done to better understand them. Um, one of the genes that 
kind of make is UBE3A that we think is important and then kind of makes a lot of this relevant of which um, copy was this coming from. Um, but I think, again, we need to do more research to understand the paternals and how they are similar or different to um, the paternals or the, the, how the maternals and paternals are different. Um, and there are gonna be samples collected for this um, during the conference. So if you're a paternal and you haven't met Vanessa, go find her. Um, the test needed for this is um, often something called like uh, methylation testing or methylation studies. One test is methylation specific MLPA, um, but there's other types of tests that can do this too. Um, and the result is usually kind of text saying that there's, uh, usually they'll say there's presence of both copies, there's not something deleted, um, but there might be extra of the one for maternal origin or paternal origin. Um, one other thing I just wanted to um, mention, and hopefully I'm still good on time, um, is just um, this thing called asymmetry. Um, and that's where um, one side in a marker chromosome is actually longer than the other side. So you might have um, four copies of one of some of the regions, in this case the, the red and the blue, um, but then you only have one copy of the yellow. And that's just because it, it's only included in there one time instead of two times. Um, so this can sometimes look really strange when you look at the report because it's saying there's four copies of one thing and three copies of another and it seems like are there two separate things and it really just means it's not a perfect mirror image and that's why it looks a little bit different. All right and I think that's it so I think I am right at time so um, I'll take any questions if there is time left. I do. Great. Yes. Let me get a microphone for you. There we go. Um, you can yell? Okay. Hi, it's um, Allison. I'm Logan's mom. I'm from uh, Westwick, Canada. And we were told, he's 21, so we were told many years ago, like 19 years ago, with that X, he had quite a bit. So from like, the typical one that goes right up to 1, 3.1. But we haven't seen that the longer amount that's, that's reproduced, he was fairly fine, high functioning. So he's fairly high functioning, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering if now, after all these years, because like, you did say, I think, that it might, it, the more genetic material that's reproduced might create more um, symptoms in the individual. Do you have any more information on that? Because we haven't noticed that in our son. Yeah, I think that's a great question. It is tricky. There's lots of different things that can go on. Um, there's some things we didn't talk about, like uh, mosaicism, where some cells have the change and some don't. Um, there's like the total copy number, which is pretty important. Um, I think these are all sort of general observations at this point, but more research is really needed to know like what specific aspects um, lead to a more or less severe presentation. Uh, the main thing we know is that that critical region is the part that causes dupe 15. Um, it's not the side ones, um, but I think, you know, there's certainly lots of kids that sort of buck our expectations of what would be more or less severe. But I think these are just sort of general rules. So I think as, as testing gets better, we'll get more and more precise about it, but I think in terms of actual kids, it, it might not make as much of a particular difference for them, especially at 21. Hi, thanks Hi. for your uh, discussion. But I have a question on one of your slides. It should have with the interstitial and the IDIC. Yeah. And with the IDIC, you mentioned that one of them, or that IDIC would have a de novo element to it, but the interstitial didn't. But I thought the interstitial could also be de novo. Yes, absolutely, yes. So um, interstitials are typically de novo. They are not typically inherited. Um, but there is a higher, it's, virtually impossible for an isodicentric to be inherited where it is rare but possible in the case of the interstitial. But absolutely for both, the most common thing is it's de novo and it's not present in parents. Anyone, okay. I'm coming, I'm coming. Um, so my question kind of goes off of Allison's. For those of us with older kids, you know, we were just talking, we had the fish studies done and that's how we got our diagnosis. So we've never had the microarrays. Is there a way to get that covered by insurance? So as an older, you know, my son's 20, almost 21. So 
that I know it's not anything we necessarily need, but it would be nice to know. And I didn't know if there was a way to work insurance to to get that done. Yeah, I think it would. I would definitely talk to your genetic counselor if you have one, or try to find one because it, it it depends on the state and the insurance. Um, I know a little bit more for like my patients of which ones I think I can do it and which ones I can, and sort of where my age limits are. Um, I think. You know, it is sort of tricky because it might not change management. Um, we sort of have the diagnosis and this is just refining it. I know for like when I have newly diagnosed patients, I do try to get everything up front so that they have it in case, you know, it, it just information for later. But as kids get older, you know, it, it can be harder because you, you've already seen the child. We know there's not going to be major changes coming up. Um, so I do think it's it's possible and worth a discussion, um, but I would have to like look at your particular insurance to know if it's going to be covered. So I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it you know it could be tricky. Other questions? Y'all, let me know if I. Oh, go ahead. Yes. Um, so your slide with the genes showing turned off and turned on yes. that was super interesting. Are you saying that they can actually ha that there's a test that can actually determine that for each child? I mean, so the tests will look at certain patterns of things. It can't look at like every particular gene per se, but what they'll do is look and see like how many copies of a gene they know in the region is turned on or turned off based on which, if it's coming from sperm or egg. Um, and then they can it sort of determine total copies that are turned on. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's... So there is yeah. a test out there that's different from the fish and the micro, I mean, yes. micro array? Okay. Yeah. And you would need to talk to a genetics counselor to perform that test in addition to a fish? Yeah, typically, yeah, I would re recommend talking to a genetic counselor because it is a special test to look okay. for that. Um, it's not something, th there's not many disorders that have imprinting involved. So it's not a common test we do, especially if we're not suspicious of one of the handful of imprinting disorders. Um, but for, um, yeah, for dupe 15, it's something that you can definitely do. Okay, great, thank you. We have time for one more question. Over here, over here. I know, I'm so glad I wore my flats. I think this means I get to eat extra dessert. <laughs> Who was it? Who has a question? Oh, yes, hi. So my question is on the extra material. Mm -hmm. um, if it is like translocated, will that have any effect on the different things that you could see in your child? That's an excellent question. So that is another one that potentially, but we don't know. So it depends on where it is translocated to and then like what starts to touch that wasn't touching before and what's not touching that used to be. Um, if it's moved into the middle of another gene, it's going to cause that gene to not work. So that could cause a problem. Um, but a lot of times if they are moved, they might end up in a spot where it doesn't make too much of a difference. So it, it very much depends on um, where it ended up and sort of where things were cut off. Um, there are some ones where the translocation by itself disrupts things even though it doesn't change any of the genes. Um, but in a lot of cases, it might not make a difference. So it would, it would depend on like the specific situation. So um, this is just a, a quick slide of the, um, the engine program at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This is our um, neurogenetics team. Um, I didn't have room for everyone on our team, just our clinical staff. But if you have um, any questions, you can reach out to us at engine at chop.edu. Um, and feel free to um, come see us if you're in the Philadelphia area. All right. Thanks so much.